telling you everything you didn't know you wanted to know. With Steve Ryan. I'm Steve Reinhardt. I'm your host. It's a beautiful day to be hosting a radio program. This is the place on Saturdays where issues of Utah culture, history, religion, and politics meet. I'm in studio with Ryan Hamilton. Trevor's out of the studio today. He's off skiing and ditching his friends here at KTOG. We're confident he'll run into a tree. We had Nancy Workman on last week and Mayor Anderson on and some city council members and an insider from Capitol Hill and have recently been delving into political topics, but we're back today with a more historical topic for the show that has some religious significance for Utah's majority here. If there's time at the end of the show, we're going to be playing some media clips and telling you about bills certain legislatures are trying to force through here in Utah. But we're very pleased with the show today. Today we're going to be exploring an archaeological topic, and we're, we have on... John Sorensen. He's an author and professor at BYU, and he's written a very important book. His book, Pre-Columbian Contacts with the Americas, one of the most widely read books on the subject. Before we go to him and start that interview, next week we're going to have on David Hurst Thomas. He's the curator of the Ancient History Museum in New York. He wrote a book on Kennewick Man, which we're going to be discussing with him. We may bring that up with John Sorensen today also. To give you a little bit of background before we bring him on the line... Dr. Sorensen, Professor Sorensen, has taught at BYU since 1953. He's an emeritus professor of anthropology. He received his Ph.D. in anthropology from UCLA, and he got his master's and bachelor's degrees from BYU in archaeology. He has a degree from Caltech in meteorology, and he's published several books, including the one we're going to be discussing today, Pre-Columbian Contacts with the Americas, and also Ancient American Settings at BYU. I've seen his name. I've seen his books for sale. I've read his books they're very, very well researched. Let's bring him on now. Professor Sorensen, are you with us? Yes. Hello, Steve. Thank you for coming on the program today. We know you're a busy guy, and it's a privilege to have you with us. I have a copy of your book, and I've looked through it and read it, and I thought it was fascinating. I can't help but wonder as I read it how many years or decades it must have taken you to compile this information. It looks like you have references in it to over 5,100 sources that suggest pre-Columbian contact with the Americans. Well, they either suggest, in, in many cases they suggest, and in other cases they are against the notion. I, I, I tried to include all the relevant uh, sources that one ought to know in order to have an informed opinion on the subject. So it's all kinds of things there. How long did it take you to write this book? Oh, dear. Uh, it's hard to, na- to, to know when some things begin uh, because you don't think of it as a beginning, but uh, this represents at least 40 years of work. Now, theories of pre-Columbian contact have been popular in Western world for, for centuries. How much evidence, in your opinion, is there? Is it overwhelming that there was pre-Columbian contact? Uh, oh, it, uh, with... it, well, I yes, I, I will say that it is overwhelming. I believe in the first case, uh, those who deny it are generally uninformed and uh, Part of my purpose in producing this this large uh, 1,200 pages of annotated bibliography is to put forward, make it accessible and available uh, material that is relevant to the question, in the hopes that it would inform informed debate. Why have archaeologists stuck to this theory that the Americas were settled by crossing the Bering Land Strait and refused to acknowledge? The legitimacy of so many of these archaeological sites you discuss in your book and these and these facts that you bring up. Well, uh, the the reason, no doubt, I don't recognize all the reasons, but a primary one has to do with the fact that there's been very little visible evidence. But my work, I think, shows that uh, visibility is in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. If if you don't want to believe it's there, it isn't there, and. Uh, so uh, the general view has been, uh, no, it isn't there. There's not satisfactory evidence, uh, and subject over. That's not good enough, though, because much of the evidence has been obscured purposely. For example, if uh, if one says uh, there's no good evidence of uh, contacts from uh, across the ocean, um, and uh, 
I'd, I'd, they would say, I would welcome good evidence, but it has to be dug up by archaeologists and accepted by professional archaeologists. Well, as it turns out, all the evidence so far has been defined by the predominant uh, authorities as not as satisfactorily professionalized, not accepted by professionals, and therefore we know that it isn't good evidence. So there's a kind of a circularity there that uh, makes it rather hard to present evidence. I just can't imagine after reading your book that anyone could believe that there were not pre-Columbian contacts with the Americas. Has your book made a dent in these perceptions that pervade the archaeological community, that there were no contacts? Have you persuaded mainstream archaeologists that there were? In, in no. Cases? no. Um, I, I, part of it is that uh, a 1,200-page pair of volumes uh, is a little too intimidating if you anticipate that you're not going to accept it to begin with. So uh, most uh, archaeologists are completely unaware of, of my work. However, uh, if I can, I'll say things have changed since that book was published. That current, that edition was 1996. In the last five or six years, a colleague of mine at the University of Oregon and I have... Uh, decided to take science or scientific evidence and not just cultural evidence uh, as uh, as to what it can tell us. And, this, and we just have uh, uh, two books being published at the present time that, that demonstrate, I think we claim, absolutely and conclusively that there were contacts and they were numerous. I can elaborate on that a little as we go on. Really quickly, let me throw the phone numbers out. We'll take some calls a little later on in the program. Salt Lake 254-5855, Provo 470-5855, Ogden 670-5855. Now, Professor Sorensen, where can your books be purchased? Before we start asking you specifics about them, on Amazon.com, where's the best place to buy them? BYU Bookstore? Uh, yes, the uh, the one that you've uh, approached me with first, Pre-Columbian Contacts with the Americas, uh, that is a publication by... Uh, uh, an agency of farms at, at BYU, and it is available only through, well, no, not only, but primarily through, and most conveniently, through BYU Bookstore. And uh, that can be uh, 1-800-253-2578 and to I believe, get to the book, bookstore. And I believe it can, you can find it online at byu.edu also. I'm sure. Yes. And, and on Amazon as as well. Before we start asking you about these specific archaeological sites, what other evidence have you come up with, and what, what is the substance of your new books going to be? Uh, is, is it like DNA uh, no, testing? No, uh, that did not seem... The results so far are not adequate for that. But uh, I decided that we needed to be hard-nosed or scientific instead of impressionistic in mustering our arguments. And so... I said, uh, uh, 2000, the year 2000, okay, I'm going to take some scientific information from biology, and uh, I'm going to see if there are plants and animals that were present in both the old world and the new world before the time of Columbus. And generally speaking, those plants or animals would be would have to have been brought by boat, if they, yeah, there are not very many that would come by Bering Strait. So, uh, so far we have established, uh, my colleague and I, 100 species of plants, including many cultivated plants, that were Native American or Native Old World plants that are, were also found before Columbus in the other hemisphere. Now, uh, uh, there is no explanation of natural mechanisms, the wind or something, carrying those plants. They are of such a nature that they had to have been brought by human beings who were voyagers. Much of the information was, uh, so some of it is by archaeology. And these books are going to be available when? Later this year? Uh, yes. One... Uh, I, I don't know. It's in the press, so I, 
I'm not sure, but at the University of Hawaii, a book in a book called Contact and Exchange in the Ancient World. This is edited by uh, Dr. Victor Mayer, M-A-I-R, at the University of Pennsylvania, and it will come out from the University of Hawaii Press uh, in the coming months. That's all I can say. And, uh, I have a large, large article in that, uh, probably running to nearly 100 pages. It's a first version of that. And we also have an a, a elaborated and uh, cleaned up and fully documented, massively documented book. Uh, call, we're calling it Ancient Voyagers Vindicated. And that will be the University of Oxford Press in Pakistan, Pakistan branch is going to put that out. And that may come out by the end of the year. It's all done, but it depends on the publisher. Well, we want to ask you when we come back from the break about some of the more popular archaeological sites that people think suggest pre-Columbian contact, including Kennewick Man, the Bat Creek Inscription, uh, several others. These may not be the best examples of pre-Columbian contact, but they're, they're among the most popular. We have David Hurst Thomas from the Ancient History Museum in New York coming on in a couple of weeks. Uh -huh. He's going to be talking about Kennewick Man. He wrote a book about it. Before we break, tell us quickly, in your book, what do you think are the strongest evidences that you have there of pre-Columbian contact for readers who just want to go directly to, to the strongest the strongest arguments in the book? Well, uh, part of the... Uh Part of the convincingness of the arguments uh, depends uh, depends on the nature of the evidence. For example, there are uh, a total of 53 species of plants which are Native American plants, as established by botanists. They originated here, but which also were known in India in ancient times because they have Sanskrit names. And Sanskrit is the ancient uh, sacred language of India, comparable, say, to Latin in the European world. And so if, if there's a name, and sometimes there are five, six, ten names in, in uh, Sanskrit for American plants, then the question is uh, not were they there because, you know, they know them and they had names for them. Um, and a number of, not all, but a number of Indian scientists are now, and Chinese also, are uh, now convinced, but they don't even have half the story yet. They'll have to get it all from uh, our writings. And more work comes from archaeology. For example, beans uh, is one of the classic American, Native American uh, plants, and uh, three different species of beans have been excavated in India as far back as 1600 BC, that uh, that calls for some fairly ambitious voyaging. Seems to me there's no other way to explain it. And how do mainstream archaeologists, archaeologists who disagree with your conclusions, rationalize these these kinds of? Uh, they don't even know about it. Uh, the thing is, uh, my concurrent work and uh, that of my colleague uh, is all with established literature. I mean, this is by. Uh, scientists, uh, literally thousands of uh, sources, but we didn't go discover anything new. We didn't dig up anything new. Uh, it's been in the literature, but it's been systematically ignored because, it, I believe, because it was uncomfortable to think new thoughts, to change the paradigm, to uh, challenge, as it were, all the established authorities. Well, my colleague and I are, are now both uh, 20 years retired, so... We don't mind challenging the authorities. <laughs> <laughs> Some of your other colleagues at uh, farms have written, one of them wrote a book on coins found in Indian burial grounds, pre-Columbian coins. Is there any truth to any of these I don't know stories who, about coins being found? I don't know who that would be. I'm not acquainted with anyone at farms who, who's done that. I wish I, I, wish I had the, the, the okay. article in front of me. But he, no, I, I don't believe it at all. I'll just be as blunt as that. I've uh, examined the evidences in the past. There's a possibility, but it's a very faint possibility, that something, somebody 
For example, there's a Viking coin that was found at an Indian site in in Maine, and uh, you know the Vikings were not there. That was not their site, but some Indians had got a Viking coin. So that oddity would be a possibility, but a very, very slim possibility. I no, I simply don't accept that. And it is it is widely believed, even by mainstream archaeologists, accepted that the Vikings landed in Nova Scotia, yes, and that they made it to the Americas, probably more in the, the Canada Greenland area than yes, than that's right. Maine. So that wouldn't be completely out of the question. I would I would think that a Viking coin could be found in an Indian burial ground, but this this other gentleman, he has a hundred. A list of a hundred archaeological sites where supposedly Jewish coins have been found. He acknowledges most of them are forgeries, but it's an interesting article to read if our users want to get on the farm's website. Tell us about Kennewick Man. I I know nothing firsthand. All I know is what I read in the papers, but I do t- try to read uh, up to date materials and uh, follow the research that's being done. And, uh, I believe there's a this last week, as a matter of fact, there's a newspaper dispatch reporting um, some of the work accomplished by 20 researchers working on different aspects of Kennewick Man. Now, why is Kennewick Man so significant to archaeologists studying American history? Well, it's one of the the best preserved uh, and one of the most recent. Actually, there are probably uh, uh, seven to nine other partial skeletons that have been recovered belong to the same general period of time, about uh, roughly 10,000 years ago or 9,000 years ago. And uh, what is particularly important about them is that they, uh, as they look to uh, well-established archaeologists, uh, they don't look like Indian skeletons. They look of a very different type. Most uh, would judge that they'd be like the Ainu of Japan, but uh, that's... There's a challenge there. Who are these guys? You know, to paraphrase uh, Sundance Kid, I, I, uh, there's a mystery of uh, about it, and there's also a conflict in that uh, eight archaeologists had to bring a lawsuit against the federal government to allow them to to uh, study Kennewick Man and to prevent the putting it away by uh, the Indian tribes. So far, they found the, 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 they appear to have succeeded in finding much more detail. The, Na- the Native American Graves and uh, Protection and Repatriation Act allows Indian tribes to get any human remains found near their tribe returned to them, regardless of when, whether, whether there's any evidence that the, the remains ever yeah. belonged to their tribe. We have to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Salt Lake 254-5855, Provo 470-5855, with John Sorsen discussing pre-Columbian contacts with the Americas. This is K-Talk, Stephen Reinhardt. AM 630, KTKK. Pick up in the front lot. Car credit is like food. It's not the food, but the appetite that makes eating a delight. You've got to have one of these donuts. My bagels are fresh and chewy. I'll take that sandwich to go. Yummy. Hi, Mark Marine here with Marine Credit Systems. Here's what my car dealership does. We paint the car credit picture. We paint it in Technicolor on a big screen with Dolby Digital Sound. We make the point. For example, love and credit. Did you know a divorce decree does not supersede the obligations of a loan? And when is it a good time to bring up credit in a newly developing relationship? Not soon enough if you ask me. So how about this for an idea? Prenuptial credit. Learn what column of finance you are in. Learn what column of finance your mate is in. And learn what column of finance you're in together. Wow. Call Marine Credit Systems now at 467-9980. Marine Credit Systems, 467-9980. 467-9980. Have you seen the cool t-shirt with the outrageous message? Well, Ragtags probably did it. Let Ragtags make those special t-shirts for your school, preschool, church, youth group, or sports teams. T-shirts are a great fundraiser for your group. A printed t-shirt starts as low as $3, so you can afford it. Ragtags is your local shop. Located in West Jordan at 7650 South Redwood Road in the Redwood Shopping Center next to Patriot Arms and across from Good Value Warehouse. Red Tags will silk screen or print your message on a t-shirt. We will make vinyl decals for your automobile or promotional items for your business. 
Ragtags loves special orders for your business or group. Even one t-shirt will be cheerfully made for you. You have to see this to believe it. Call Tradio Todd at 347-4500 for more information. That's 347-4500. Just imagine your family picture on a t-shirt for everyone in your group. Ragtags at 7650 South Redwood Road. Or call 347-4500. Welcome back to K-Talk. I'm your host. I'm Steve Reinhardt. This is the place where you test culture, history, politics, and religion collide. We're discussing a historical issue today, pre-Columbian contacts with the Americas, and we've got the foremost authority on the subject on the line with us, Professor John Sorensen from BYU, who's been studying this for over 50 years. Professor Sorensen, we uh, want to ask you about some other things, including the Bad Creek inscription and, and a few other things, but we have a caller on line three who has a question for you really quick. Do you mind taking a couple of calls? Oh, fine. We have Derek on line three. Derek, are you with us? Oh, yeah, Professor. Yes. Uh, yeah, I got a question. Uh, I've been reading a lot um, in some different magazines. Uh, what, what do you think about this guy uh, from Wales, Maddock, coming over in uh, 1170? Have you heard about that? Yes. There, there's uh, My bi bibliography has references to probably 30 or 40 uh previous publications there, there's nothing I, new I, I don't know much about it i just i, I read that the guy okay, came over in 1170 yeah yeah there 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 is a tradition to that effect but there's very little information that goes along with the tradition and not quite enough to establish anything but there's been speculation so uh, I, I, isn't he alleged to have landed in missouri or well somewhere, somewhere in the east there are various views uh uh, somewhere in the eastern half of the United States. But uh, evidence, well, what is evidence? There, there's a variety of stuff that is taken as evidence by some. Um, there's not enough to convince me. Neither, neither is there enough that it, I can rule it out, or I think anyone can rule it out. It's possible. What, what evidence I, is in dispute? Tradition. How much do you... No, or how concrete is the information that comes from tradition? Sometimes it's rather on the vague side. And so uh depends on what your taste is as far as evidence is concerned. If you, if you think that traditions are reliable and have been passed down adequately all these years, um, you may be impressed. Others say... Professor, what's the story, though? That's what, that's what I'm kind of wondering. I, I know it's maybe not proven, but what... What is actually the traditional story about this Maddock guy? Well, they realize it was written from the European point of view. He, he left there, and we don't have, have any kind of tradition or documentation about what happened if he did get to America. So uh, maybe he crossed the ocean. And he, he left Wales, so, uh, I think, yes, it was Wales. Uh, reportedly left uh, Wales in the a ship or a fleet of ships, and uh, if, if you suppose he was a pretty good sailor, then maybe he did get to America. But uh, uh, that, that's not very sure. If, if somebody found a document in the America's side with uh, a legend about a guy who came from across the Atlantic, then that would be interesting evidence. There's no such thing, of course. You only have the tradition from the whale side and that doesn't tell the final story i read about this as well and somebody suggested that the reason the native americans believed in believed in quetzalcoatl may have been because this maddox fellow got here yeah and, that's possible hey uh, professor i i kind of got another question too I, I read another article you, you guys are talking about the vikings uh coming down towards even maine and the uh, thing, yes what, what, i heard that they got cats like native cats that have been here, and they found like a Scandinavian breed of cat, like in their DNA or something. Have you heard about that? Yes, I'm amazed that yeah, that you would have heard about it because I'm a smart guy. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, you are. That was only published in a scientific journal, and I don't. Uh, yes, I read the original source on it, and these were zoologists talking about cat breeds. But I don't know, they didn't say how they knew that this was related to cats living in the Northeast today. That's what they felt, but uh, I don't know what the link between Vikings and Boston cats would be now. So the I don't Vikings know what to make of it. Do they bring their cats on their boats or what? I don't know. <laughs> Not as far as I know. 
seems to me. Uh, I guess that is kind of evidence. If they, the cats do have Scandinavian breeds, yeah, that yeah. could have been the Vikings went down yeah. all the way to Maine. It's possible. I, I should add with that that uh, there is a uh, writing of the runic kind. This is the type of writing common in Scandinavia back in those days. And uh, those inscriptions have been found all the way down the coast of South America. And that's really a mystery how that took place. If, if that's real, and it appears to me that the evidence is real, then uh, there is the question, oh, how far did the Vikings go? Maybe they did a single ship went on south and left some inscriptions. And if so, maybe they were equipped to, for a lengthy stay and had cats. I don't know. It's just not enough information to assure me one way or the other on that. But I'm still open on it. Well, I, I don't know. I just, I, I just, I find that so, uh, so interesting. Uh, I mean, these Vikings, I mean, they, they had these crazy boats and, you know, colonies. Uh, I, I know they had a huge colony in that Newfoundland, and yeah. eventually it, it, like, died out. Eventually, I mean, it, it got whittled down to, like, 200 people, and they all left. That's, that's according to the stories of those who left and went back to Europe. And, yeah, that's generally accepted in some form or other. I guess my, my question is, I mean, do some, do any science, scientists have theories that people in, in North America, that they could have actually been Scandinavian? <sighs> Well, the the Mandan Indians on the upper Missouri River, uh, they were visited by Lewis and Clark, uh, the Lewis and Clark ex expedition, for example, and they stayed with them over winter. And uh, a number of people uh, in the 19th century believed that they were white enough and different enough that uh, they could have been due to some Nor uh, some Norse ancestors, but uh, there's no good evidence on that. Uh, that's just impressions that they had. Hey, Derek, we appreciate the call very much. We have to take a quick commercial break. Right. We will be right back with Professor John Sorensen. So like 254-5855. We lost a couple of callers there with some technical right. difficulties in the last minute. Please stay with us through the break, Professor Sorensen. we got a two-minute break. We'll be right back. This is Kate Doc. KTKK. Dex, I just invented a cold fusion engine that can also play video poker. That's awesome. And weird. But awesome. And weird. Ipso facto, I need a patent lawyer. I have 37 patent lawyers. Uh, now they should also handle trademarks. Now I have 22 trademark patent lawyers. And Dex, they should be within five miles of here. Six nearby trademark patent lawyers. Hmm. And uh, have at least 12 years experience. Let me get this straight. You want an experienced nearby patent lawyer who handles trademarks? Yes. Why didn't you just say so? DexOnline.com. It's the fastest way to find the most complete local information online. And now DexOnline.com lets you use keywords and new search options to quickly and easily narrow your search right from the get-go. You can even get a map and driving directions. So easy, so much information. That's why it's the most used local internet yellow pages. Restrepo Law Partners should take care of your fusion slash poker needs. Yes, I'm off to change the world. Thanks to you, Dex. Nah, shucks. Go fusion! And poker. DexOnline.com. Dex knows. Dependable. Hardworking. Breadwinner. These are words you used to hear. Then your health failed, you couldn't work, and all that changed. Still, you didn't worry, because for years, you paid in Social Security taxes, knowing that the government would keep its bargain to pay you Social Security disability if you couldn't go on. But so far, the government hasn't kept its promise. You're exhausting your savings, and you're facing the battle of your life. It's a battle you don't have to fight alone. I'm Henry Wansker of Deseret Disability Law, and I've been fighting the government in cases just like this for people just like you for nearly 25 years. I'd be honored to represent you. Call 746-7272 or toll free 866-393-7272. Deseret Disability Law. Social Security Disability is what we do and it's all we do. Hi, this is Rick with Total Health and Fitness, and I want you to stop what you're doing. Do you know that half the stuff people are doing right now to try to lose weight is actually causing them to gain weight? 
and almost 100% of those that lose weight end up just gaining it back plus more simply because they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Are you one of the millions of Americans that are failing to achieve their fitness goals no matter what they try? Well, I'm so confident our 12-week program is going to work for you that I'm willing to mail you a copy of our DVD absolutely free. Packed full of all the most powerful and scientifically proven diet and exercise techniques available on the market today. This DVD includes our 45-minute length educational seminar along with amazing testimonials, before and after pictures that will blow you away. Everything you need to know about fat loss is on this DVD, from what kind of foods to use to speed up your results to how to break plateaus. A $50 value that until now has only been available to clients. But this amazing offer won't last for long, so don't miss this opportunity to receive one for free. Call 478-2785. Secretaries are standing by, but supplies are limited, so call right away. 478-2785. That's 478-2785. This is K-Talk. I'm Steve Reinhardt. I'm your host. This is the place we explore cultural issues relate to Utah, political, historical, religious. We've got Professor John Sorensen with us on the phone, author of Pre-Columbian Contacts with the Americas, the authoritative book on Pre-Columbian Contacts with, with America. Professor Sorensen, we have a couple of callers who'd like to ask you questions, and then we've got some questions for you of our own. Let's see if we can go to these callers really quickly, and then we'll move on with these questions. Dave, are you with us? Yes, Dr. Sorensen. Yes. Yes, uh, you knew uh, uh, Thomas Stewart Ferguson, is that correct? Yes, I did. Yes. What, what do you think it was that uh, uh, propelled him or impelled him to uh, to perhaps lose his faith in the uh, you know in much of that of which he uh, he authored in One Fold and One Shepherd? And then also an, a follow up question, and I'll get off the air, and then you can give the answer. And what do you think about Bishop Southerton and his his DNA studies? And I'll, I'll hang up for those two questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, my association with Ferguson was uh, way back in the 1950s. I, I went through the state of Chiapas in Mexico with him, uh, the first investigation archaeologically of that area where the foundation that he originated uh, has continued to work ever since. But uh, uh, he was not an archaeologist, archaeologist in any sense. He was a lawyer who had a hobby of reading some things in archaeology. He was a tremendous enthusiast, a salesman, but his arguments made me very uncomfortable from the beginning. We were together going from place to place uh, looking for sites, and we, we found something like, in, in a 10-day period, we, we found like uh, 30 sites, archaeological sites, that had not been reported before. And, but his approach was exemplified by questions he would ask. He'd ask people, have you found any iron ore around around here? Or have you ever seen any figurines of horses? Well, that's hardly uh, the way an archaeologist... It's not an objective approach. Uh, yeah, it's not a curious. It's not uh, intellectually curious to find out what is there. It's just, uh, can you give me something to grind my axe on? So, uh, I consider Tom my friend, and it is a good question why somebody is so strongly enthusiastic at one point and then later on is not enthusiastic. But I can assure you it's not because of what he knew. It's something personally that was troubling him, and I don't know what it was. Now, as to uh, uh, Southerton, uh, he is labeled as a geneticist, but... All his work was in plant genetics. This, this is something like uh, asking a podiatrist, uh, what's wrong with your eyes? A uh, uh, person has to have the right specialty, and there are, there are genetic scientists who uh, have adequate explanations to counter what Southerton has said, now, I read who it. are infinitely more informed than he is. I read about his studies as well. He, other critics say he tested the wrong DNA strand. Isn't that right? Well, he didn't test anything. All he did was take what the literature says, and much of that is inadequate. As many experts admit, that we don't know nearly enough yet to answer any questions, let alone the big questions. So uh, in 20 years... We'll see if anything he said has any merit. I don't find any merit at this time. Let's really let's go quickly to Walter on line four. Okay. 
Walter, you what's? Yeah. Oh, hey, uh, Steve. Uh, um, great show, by the way. I just wanted to ask. I uh, mentioned something that I, I think I, I might use it like in the back of my mind. Didn't some some guy? It might have been, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. But he he sailed from uh, Brazil to Israel in like a bamboo boat to prove it could be done or something. And I'm I'm on the freeway right now, and so I'll just hang up and listen to your answer. But it, it just seems like somebody made that made it successfully. Yeah, I'm Thank aware you. I'm aware of that as well. Show, Steve. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for the call. Appreciate cool. yeah, there are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, oddball voyages that uh, could be put together in a book and it would be fascinating just because of the adventures involved. Uh, one guy crossed the Atlantic in a bathtub. If you believe that. And wow. others uh, rowing uh, the way across with oars and all kinds of things. Somebody went from California to Hawaii who was blind. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, just to show that it could be done. So uh, there's a great deal of uh, information about crossing from Africa to South America, from Portugal to South America, from England to Maine and so on. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of cases, most of which are only mentioned briefly. Uh, but uh, it, it's fascinating stuff. It, it, it does show that a lot of people went a lot of places that, that or they could at least have gone across the ocean that way. And it refutes these mainstream archaeologists' notion that it wasn't possible a thousand years ago to cross the Atlantic. That's right. I, I particularly you know to uh, a German uh, MD who took a once a canoe from Africa to South America, and once uh, an inflatable uh, boat, and uh, after a total of three trips across the solo trips across the southern Atlantic, he was of the opinion that quote it takes a damn fool to sink a boat at, in the, on the high seas. <laughs> tell, tell us quickly, we, we have about uh, nine minutes left in the show, and we have to take a one more two-minute commercial break, but tell us about the Bad Creek inscription. I find this to be one of the most interesting possible archaeological evidences of pre-Columbian contact, specifically Jewish contact with America. What do you know about it? Is there any truth to the veracity of the Bad Creek inscription? First, tell our users what it is. Uh, this was something that was dug up in uh, by a Smithsonian archaeologist, which doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, uh, this is around, oh, 1870, somewhere between there and 1890 mm -hmm. in Tennessee. And uh, digging in a mound, he found this uh, remnants of uh, some kind of an artifact. Uh, it was metal, copper, along with some wood fragments and uh, a stone. And the stone had inscriptions that, on it that uh, seemed to be Hebrew or something, something like that. Uh, others claimed that it was just Indian writing, or sort of at random. But uh, in the last 20 years, uh, a man who is a professor at uh, Ohio State University has been re-examining re the evidence and was able to get uh, a radiocarbon date on uh, the wood fragments still saved at Smithsonian that uh, seemed to date the stone. And it, it was a long time ago, a couple of thousand years ago, roughly. We'll, we'll uh, be right back. We have a two-minute commercial break that we have to take. Solid 254 5855 Provo 470 We're talking to John Sorensen, author of Pre-Columbian Contact with the Americas You Buy on Amazon.com, BYU.edu. I'm Steve Reinhart. We'll be right back. Please hold with us. Castlestone Homes presents a proven way to invest in real estate with no cash out of pocket. This is Mills Crenshaw. Whether you're planning a home of your own or you're looking for a real estate investment, Castlestone has a better way. If you have a credit score of 700 or better, Castlestone has exciting new projects that can earn you up to $50,000 or more in less than a year. 
with no cash out of pocket. Your earnings depend on the projects you choose, but the current projects are some of the most exciting ever offered. Castlestone uses respected contractors, most of whom have 30 plus years experience. Find out for yourself how you can earn a substantial second income investing in real estate with no cash out of pocket. Call 604-8000. That's 604-8000. Call Castlestone Homes at 604-8000 now. Looking for the perfect gift? Look no further. Active Nails gives the gift of beauty, time, and ease. With Active Nails, there are no backfills, no harmful chemicals, no broken or split nails, just beautiful nails all the time. Active Nails makes sure you never have to worry about rescheduling your life around your manicure appointments again. Active Nails are applied and removed at your leisure when you choose. Active Nails are custom created for your hands. They look polished and perfect every time you wear them. There is no filling or drilling to your natural nail. It is a pain-free process, and one set of active nails can last a lifetime. You can wear active nails every day or just for special occasions. The choice is yours. Call now to find out about seasonal specials for only 25% down on your set of active nails today. To learn more, call 801-924-0002 or visit their website at activenail.com. Again, that number... Nine two four zero 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 two. Active Nails. This is K Talk. I'm Steve Reinhardt. We tell you everything you never knew you wanted to know. We've got Professor John Sorensen on the line with us, author of Pre-Columbian Contacts with the Americas. You can buy it on Amazon.com at the BYU Bookstore, BYU.edu. We'll take you there. The most, it's the most authoritative book written on evidence that people before Columbus had contact here with the Americas. I, I apologize for interrupting you there, Professor Sorensen. We had to take that break. If we go too long, the, yep, sure. the break comes on. But you're telling us about the back of inscription. So this researcher who's been studying it for 20 years has dated it to the era that... A long time ago, anyway. And it, it, it looks like it says in Hebrew, for the land of the Jews. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yes, that's, that's a, a decent reading. Now, how can mainstream archaeologists refute something like this? Do they just claim it's a forgery? Do they write it off? Do they just ignore it? Well, the best thing to do is, uh, for someone in that position is simply to ignore it. And that's what's been done. My uh, uh, pre-Columbian contacts book, uh, I have uh, in the index 24 articles or books that are, are concerned with Bat Creek inscription, pro and con. And uh, if anyone wished to examine that they'd find all kinds of arguments, but mostly just bias. Uh, no real attempt to objectively examine the evidence. You either believe it or you don't, and you argue accordingly. It looks like it was discovered, like you said, in about 1890, and for 100 years, almost 100 years, people didn't realize the significance of it. If someone had forged it, surely they would have brought the attention, uh, you know, the significance of their forgery, you know, to light. So that suggests strongly to me that it's that it's authentic. It says well, in I'm, Hebrew for the land of the Jews. I don't know how people can uh, can argue with this too much. Well, I, I, you can argue with it if it makes you uncomfortable because you wonder how in the world did it get here. Mm-hmm. Well, the fact is, if they if it got here, then that's another question. How? I just leave it at that. We only have just a couple of minutes left yeah. in the program, but quickly tell us. I asked you this earlier. What are the most interesting archaeological sites that you researched in your book, and what do you think some of the most interesting archaeological sites that are currently being researched are that bear come to bear on this subject? Is, uh, is there any offhand, any offhand you can mention? No, you. Uh, uh, the thing is, uh, the point of view or the point of bias taken by mainstream archaeologists is such that if uh, if a site did seem to have evidence of the uh, pre-Columbian contacts, they wouldn't look at it. They wouldn't dig it. <laughs> what, what do you what do you think about uh, this petroglyph that uh, people call the Lehigh Stone? They've got pictures and replicas of it down in Provo everywhere. The, the Smithsonian said it's, it uh, doesn't have any significance. Others say that it does. Do you, do you know what I'm referring to? Yes, certainly. It's called, it's called the Lehigh Stone. What, what, do you, what do you think it means? I don't take it seriously. I was a student of Professor Jakeman who originally put forward these ideas, and I didn't believe him as a student, and I have not believed him as a, as a colleague 
thereafter. I, I simply do not find it at all persuasive of uh, what it is argued. And I wish all, all the uh, replicas and so on that are found in Provo would disappear. I see them in churches. I see them at BYU. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's more just kind of faith-promoting rumor and conjecture, I, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, that's right. I understand that the Mayans had a writing system that's yet to be deciphered. And no, that, it's been deciphered in the last 30 years. Uh, the decipherment is, uh, is told about in a fascinating story in a brilliant book called Breaking the Maya Code by Michael Coe. And uh, that's a fascinating read and uh, easy to read, too. But it tells the story of the decipherment, which has been in the last, fundamentally in the last 30 years. Uh, yes, it, the inscriptions can be, and many of them have been. Professor Sorensen, your, your book is fascinating. The work you've done is fascinating. We thank you very much for coming on the program. It's been a pleasure to have you. I, uh, I, let me just say that if uh, somebody has a, a genuine question uh, of significance to them, I can be address them at email at uh, john underscore Sorensen, S-O-N, at uh, byu.edu. I'll be glad to respond within the limits of my ability. We encourage our users to email Professor Sorensen. We appreciate everyone tuning in today. I'll be back next week at 1 o'clock.